My name is Youssef Travali. I'm the vice president for the next Einstein Forum. And uh, we are welcoming today uh, Dr. Ekaria Olushi Nwashi. Is it correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did a good job. Why she? <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you for accepting this, to give this, uh, this webinar. So Karia is a senior lecturer at the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria with work experience in diverse industries, including the Dangote Group, Coca-Cola, and Shell Petroleum Development Company. So she is an environmental biochemist with interest in environmental assessment, monitoring, and remediation, and most recently focused on finding sustainable and safe sanitation strategies for remediation of petroleum impacted environments, finding which are well um, received. So uh, Karia has devoted most of her spare time engaging local communities and polluters to create, yes. create more uh, synergy and sustainable impact in the area of recovery of petroleum impacted environment despite security challenges in the area. Awards and recognition to her credit include Faculty of Science, University of Port Harcourt 2016 Hall of Fame, affiliate uh, membership to African Academy of Science, International Fellow to the 2015 Commonwealth Fellowship, 2015 University of Port Harcourt Distinguished Merit Awards, 2013 UNESCO L'Oreal International Fellowship, and most importantly, Next Einstein Forum Fellow. So, Karia, welcome. Thank and, uh, you so much. We are ready to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, uh, Yusuf, for having me and for the nice introduction. And welcome all of us from the great continent, Africa. Because today's topic is diversity challenges in the laboratory a critical variable for Africa's growth. I did a series of web webinar by NEF, NEF Einstein Forum. Okay, today we go through the introduction, problems and opportunities, contextual concern, modifications that we can make, intellectual property issues, we make conclusion with few recommendations. And I take your questions if there are. So by way of introduction, if you look at this, this space here, you see the wonderful globe with all distributions of countries, especially located within the continent, the seven continents of the world. And Africa happens to be one of those seven. And Africa is blessed with diverse, <coughs> Africa is blessed with diverse um, attributes and has over 3,000 distinct ethnic groups, and also over 2,000 languages. You can see it's quite rich. Okay, so diversity, when a lot of people ask me, what is diversity? What do you mean by diversity? So that's what, what we're gonna do today. So diversity, I mean here as understanding that each individual is unique and recognizing our individual differences. So this can go along the dimensions of race, religion, color, culture, political beliefs, and other ideologies. It constitutes uh, diversity. And we're trying to see how diversity can be harnessed for Africa's growth. So we're looking at laboratory. So I began thinking about what does laboratory mean for all of us? As most of us here are scientists, so we have a very vast spread of science. So my laboratory may not be the same as laboratory for the climate change scientists, for the physicists, for the mathematicians. So that's why I try to put a lot of laboratories here. So we have the laboratories showing us a space, a facility where we have controlled conditions to manipulate or to operate so we can have reproducibility of experiments that we do. We also have the one with human experiment for clinicians, those who are studying human beings. We also have the, we also have the view showing us the observational science, looking, making some observations. We have also the workstation 
for computer scientists, for engineers, for simulators. We also have a field space for those who carry out field work there. That's me in that space with my um, ex-graduate student while we do our remediation work in the bush. Okay, you also can have your laboratory for those doing experiments, conducting interviews with key informants, sitting around the table and trying to find out what the issues are. You also have extension services scientists here. So you have you and your team talking to the group of people doing your regular extension services. So these are more uh, different laboratories that we can imagine. And it's important that as all of these spaces exist for us researchers. So we have big data churned out from this. And this is the time, the best time for us to have big data as man continues to conquer the world, to manipulate, to exploit for his or her own good. Okay, this big data needs a lot from us. This big data needs management, it needs storage, it needs archiving. It needs interpretation, comparing, contrasting, and simulation. So that's why we need all of these diverse laboratories and individuals managing them with different attributes to come together. And more importantly, that this big data that we churn out, if well harnessed and if passed through sound scientific design, we harvest evidence, research evidence that can be used by government agencies and all the policy makers that you can imagine. So that's why I say here that government agencies everywhere look to lab to solve difficult issues in terms of bio, trace, phases, environment, health, green technology, nuclear stockpiles, stewardship, all of this and more is in our hands. So we are really very important. So why are we thinking about diversity beyond Africa? By the picture we have here, the, the um, nine persons you have in that lab in Massachusetts are people from different countries, from nine countries, as you can see all day. So here you see me, um, my colleague in Poland. So all of the diversity that we find in the laboratories happen to give what developmental needs met because many of the unhighlighted solutions to our daily problems are highlighted in the process of coming together from different um, situations and conditions and circumstances. So when we have the same kind of people in a laboratory for ages, it calls for monotony, yeah. So monotony is not good for development. And Africa is beginning to look at specialized centers, some sponsored by World Bank and different kinds of agencies, and some also inwardly sponsored by the industry, like the Port Harcourt, where I am, we have the oil industry, sponsoring specialized centers, housing, research laboratories with specific interest and scope. So those kind of centers are germane to developmental needs of the country where they are and also the region, even the continent as a whole. So when we come together, different people from different backgrounds, different colors, different races, different religions, different culture coming together, we come together because we have a common cause. You don't just come together because you can't waste your money, go from one place to, all, to the other if you do not have a meeting point. So because we have a meeting point, that's why we come together. And when we come together, a lot happens. We learn from each other and we learn to unlearn that some of the erroneous beliefs that we keep, we hold very hard to our hearts are not really true after all. So we learn to respect ourselves. One thing I want us to do is to learn from traditional sciences as people who are thinking about diversity in our laboratories for Africa development. Traditional science spanning from physical life, earth, space, and human sciences have a lot to teach us that we are not learning. We should put our heads down, put our ears down to listen what they have, what message they have to pass across to us. If you look at the physical science here, um, the Nobel, the um, Nobel, Alfred Nobel, that set up, set up the um, Nobel Award, says if you break the laws of physics, you go to Sweden and get a Nobel Prize. But those who are religious, the, uh, the Christian don't say if you break the laws of man, you go to hell. 
But thesis is saying something. Break, come out of the normal, come out of the comfort zone, break the laws, and you go for a Nobel Prize, yeah? So look at the life sciences. What is it telling us? Very important. You see the egg and you see the chick. So the chick will always wait when it's mature, it's gonna say, I'll peck my way out of here. Likewise, the fishes, they wanna come out by themselves. But the species, man and women, we do not like to peck our ways out of anywhere. So you see the baby says, push woman. So that tells us a lot about the life sciences, that man representing man and woman. So lives are pushed. And when we have the diversity, it cracks up push because a lot of things, there are friction, a lot of things are not together. There are differences. So we have a push to get better. That's why diversity is very important. The air science is telling us there is a rotation that makes our day. So you rotate from like your lab to another person's lab. You go to different conferences as we're here talking to ourselves. I listen to you, you listen to me. So we are obeying the laws of the earth science. Space is telling us, I need some space. What does that tell us? You need a space for innovation. You need space to come out to think and to do something differently. Human science is amazing. If you see what human science is telling us here, he's saying the stomach has acid, hydrochloric acid, with pH between two and three. And this acid, we can know from the chemists and from engineers that it can dissolve the stainless steel, yeah? That is contained in the stomach, very fragile flesh that we have. We house acid that is capable of dissolving stainless steel. Then what does the body do with it? With all the complexities and diversities in our bodies, it does not destroy the stomach lining. But the stomach lining will produce bicarbonate alkali that will neutralize the effect of the acid and they exist together. So what that tells me is that the arsenals we have as individuals, as scientists, as researchers, are not for destruction, are not to wage war against ourselves, but to find a way of unity in diversity, okay? So if, for example, you're a chemist and you're producing chemicals, you shouldn't use them for nuclear weapons. You should use that arsenal to help agriculture, making fertilizers, use it to make polymers, okay, to help the industries and help the medical field to make drugs and all of them. So I love this lesson from traditional medicine. We have to make an inclusive science for us to come out stronger and get the continent working. That's why we're celebrating diversity in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. So what happens when we are so indulged in our science that we forgot, we forget about those who are around us, those who are listening to us, those we want to influence with our scientific findings. If you look at this image here, Morris is an accountant at the Botany Institute, not a biologist. But the Biology Institute has decided to label the combinations with stamen and pistol, saying stamen is a male flower, pistol is a female flower. So they have forgotten to make a space for Maurice, who is an accountant. So he really needs to pee, but he's confused looking at stamina and pistol. It doesn't make sense to him. So this is what we do in the different laboratories where we are not making considerations for people who are not of our background, who are not of our races, of our religion, and different attributes. Reality really can be very complex. Look at these two sections. This individual sees four, this sees three, and both of them are correct at the same time. So the yelling, it is four. This one says, no, it is three. This is what we do. I am white skinned, I'm black skinned, I'm yellow skinned, I am chocolate skinned, so I am better. I am tall, I'm short, I'm fat, and slender on all of the attributes. I am better. So, but from our perspectives, if you wear the lens to look at different perspectives, you will find that they have a point and we can see how to harness all of these differences for our own advantages. So if you look at the problems and opportunities, so we need to recognize effect that these have on others. The first problem I want to look at is the researcher population increase. 
So as we begin to work together to have the diversity reflected in our constituent laboratories, we have the population of the researchers grow. And as they grow, it becomes a challenge, it becomes a problem because you need to cater for all the researchers and then problems will be multiplied with diversity, okay? Because there is always friction when people are, who are not of the same kind come together. They need to understand themselves. So we also have limited real estate. There may be need now to expand the laboratories, to expand building, or even to move, to move your facility to another location, make applications. And that is not left with attendance, um, attendance um, hazards with making approvals, with getting the government agencies or the regulatory houses to come make approvals for these new houses. One of the new courses, same thing applied to new courses, because as we imbibe in diversity, we start thinking about new courses, interdisciplinary courses, and these are also problems to manage them. Who are the teachers? Who will begin these areas? Who will administer? Who are the, who are the directors who haven't got this experience in the past? All of those are big problems that we need to manage. What are the obsolescence? Because as you move, as you grow bigger, with our diversity, a lot of um, our instruments like the computers will get obsolete. And then we have a lot of waste because sooner or later, we may not need them again. It becomes obsolete. So we have a lot of things to waste. Do we have a plan to recycle them into something better? We need to think about it. Then the maintenance cost. Of course, with the expanded size of the building, the real estate, the new courses to administer the uh, researchers' population, you have a lot of cost to attend to. So these are challenges. So here I'm saying that the strategies and long-term oriented awareness of African indigenous knowledge need to come in so we can see how to manage some of this problem. The values, cultural, religious, climatic, color, and stylistic attributes will always bring non-desirable friction and this will make advances in the long run for social progress and unity in developmental strides in the continent. So we really need at this point, we need government to come in to make policies that are working and also have the industry and the researchers in kind of um, a triple helix so that government is making serious commitments and policies, okay, with some trade-offs and we have the industries making investment commitment and the researchers gaining skills in science communication to push out what the impact of what we do in those small spaces we call laboratories are. So we look at the conscious bias that we have all the time. So these days we have people making complex decisions. These unconscious preferences that we call bias mean that we tend to prefer people who look like us or people who are dominant on the job. So maybe the enterprise is in Nigeria and you have more Nigerians. So there, are that, there is that tendency that you will be focusing on the dominant group, leaving the minority. So that diversity component is not being handled. So now it affects the way we recruit when we hire the way we allocate jobs, this is your job description. What we think is very sensitive. We like to give it to those who are like us. View performance, the way we do our appraisal, decide who to promote, give feedback to people, coaching and mentoring, having time, sponsoring and trusting. So all of these are influenced by this unconscious bias. These biases are unconscious because research has shown that only 40 in 11 million persons are conscious of the bias. These are very unconscious. That's why we really need to grow our capacities to get conscious of these biases. So we end up filling jobs and our teams with the same kind of people, giving the unconscious biases that play in our minds. So we get the wrong people because there are not going to be differences in what we do because they are the same kind of people who view things from similar background and possibly from the same kinds of field, instead of coming to embrace interdisciplinary um, science. So we encourage panel members, wherever they are, even in our NEF, to deliberately slow down 
with decision making. Reconsider the reasons for decisions. Are the pivot is tilted A, B, down and up. Why are they this way? Are there, are there some faulty instruments there? Are the ways the same or different? What made it? We need to really reconsider and question the cultural stereotypes. Then monitor each other for unconscious biases. We can help ourselves in the panel. I can, why are you choosing this person? I can say, ah, um, is a Nigerian, is a Kenyan, is that, is that? Ah, he looks beautiful. Um, he looks handsome, she looks beautiful. Whatever thing, attribute that you look at to make that decision, you have to really say that you are fair in all that you're doing. So in our context in Africa, we see that the continent is blessed with rich, relevant local expertise and talent. We can't doubt that here we're in South Africa, this is really a continental outing looking at um, intellectual property. So are we harnessing, after this meeting, since we came back, how many of these people we have on this space have I contacted to keep touch with a lot of these expertise that are found in the continent? We are quick to do that when they are white-skinned. Yes, a lot of us are guilty, yeah? So how many times are we doing that? If Africa is really to play in the fourth industrial revolution and contribute, to over 5% of course of the uh, global economy, then there needs to be more strategic plan to improve collaboration among and across the continent. This is very important for us because a lot of us go to the other climes and develop IPs in the laboratories and it belongs to the laboratories and to the institutions and to the countries or to the co uh, continent. So what are we doing to ourselves? This is not good. So I said triple helis also is very important here if we have any enabling policies that will get our laboratories working. So we can even have ourselves come for postdoctoral experiences in African countries. Why do we all run to Europe, America, and these days Canada for our postdoctoral experiences? Because we are not valuing the rich culture, the rich expertise and relevant to one at all um, in that manner that we have in Africa. This is also a Western, a regional, a regional audience that you have here on this um, slide. So when we work together, I found out that we learn and cross fertilize ideas, share data, learn some skills like data management, because the data is very important. I mentioned big data. It's very important to all of us, for us to move forward and reduce unnecessary waste, okay, by reinventing the will that we do in different parts of the continent. So using the existing data set makes sense because it can save time and also money. Another thing very important when we're relating within ourselves as Africans is to show warmth. This is also a global problem. We show warmth while we're demonstrating our competencies. Most times we concentrate on our science that we become as parts we are competent but we do not show want. So people have always ranked us high with competency, but very low with want. And that has made us to miss our target of influencing the people we want to influence, influencing the society and influencing ourselves. So if we do not consider diversity and you don't show want because they are not of the same kind with you or because they are not in the majority of the people over there, so you lose, even with your competence, you cannot influence the target group you have in mind as scientists. So like I said earlier, we have these colors, those who are darker, those who are almost yellowish, and the chocolate people like myself. <laughs> so what do we do then is to partner. Effective partnership, whether upstream or downstream side of the research is very essential to bring and promote new and sustainable research outcomes. So we need a lot of new outcomes and then sustainable. We don't have to make progress today and tomorrow, next tomorrow, they are off. So it has to be sustainable and we want new solutions to myriads of problems we have in Africa. Yeah? Assessment that count paper by fractional contributions are three or more auto paper in many of the African countries. When we meet in conferences, in meetings, in workshops, in African science leaders uh, platform, 
we find that many of the universities are counting paper by fractional contribution. For example, and society is a small fraction of the credit of a single auto paper. So if what that means is that you auto paper with your colleagues from Uganda, from Kenya, from Ghana, from Rwanda, and then you lose the mark because you are many multidisciplinary kind of research, and then you lose the marks. This is a turnaround of events. It's very weird. So we should, in our different climes, in our different countries, in Africa, push for policy changes, that this is not helping us in Africa. Because if people are going to earn more marks for publishing papers alone, or two persons publishing, they are going to do loan research, and loan research is not holistic, it's myopic most times, the research questions are not very um, encompassing in nature. We have to look at this. What are trends chasing in our context in Africa? A lot of us are chasing the trend. But even when you are immune, that a researcher, you're immune to trend, the trend of time, when the traditional science is no longer getting the funding, the, the attention it requires. If you're immune to trend chasing, you focus on your research and stay on it, which is great. So what happens to the funders? The board that consider your applications for funding are not immune. They're looking for the trend. They're chasing the trend where the world is going. Oh, everybody's going to climate change. Let's go there. And then some parts of the science will suffer. But if we're doing interdisciplinary and multi-research, we are we considering diversity. That means we can find this money because some of us in the team will be in the trending area, while some of us are not, even as we are also solving the societal problems. So it is important to know that when you have a solution that affects the society positively, it becomes now a global problem, a continental problem. It's no longer your problem, but it's a societal problem. So it needs to be opened up so we can have a holistic approach to solving it. Yeah. We also have cultural barriers that have the disproportionate impact on female scientists, yeah? When we went to Rwanda for some leadership workshop, I got these beautiful photos of beautiful women who were dancing. These women, they had to almost become rebels before they broke even to do what their inner heart desired to beat drums. They told us their story that it was not for the females in the tradition. It was males who beat drums and they danced. But their leader had that desire to initiate this. And they are doing well now. They are very international. They go in places dancing and playing drums. So they fought government and they did a lot of things to break even. So these are kinds of cultural barriers that we have that militate against what we can do to take a leap to the next level and get the continent out of the mess we are in today. Everybody pities us like the cat. Meow, meow, please help me. Yeah, we need to go over this. We also have even science in the pub. Oftentimes our researchers, we close the work, we go home as women, most people, most women go home. And the men go to the pub, drinking bars to drink. And they assemble there and begin research questions. They design the research questions take important decisions concerning the research, the laboratory at the, bar, at the beer parlor. And then what happened? The voices of the women are not heard. So these are cultural barriers that we can look at, bring them out and think about how to overcome them. Open educational research that enhances teaching and learning is hit with challenges in Africa of poor access to open data um, with progress in the development of African languages. So when they want to pass the learning, the teaching and learning, which is the ultimate goal in different African languages. I said we have over 2000 languages. It's not possible because most of these languages have not been attended to by a linguist in this part of the world. So we have a lot of work to do. It's affecting us. We also don't have the open sharing, open sharing attitude to our data. Yeah, the raw data, open science, we are not embracing it. What are we waiting for? The African Academy of Science has started 
um, the journal they call um, Open, Open, what do they call it? AAS Open. Yeah, that's the name of the journal. So this journal is really very good. It's new. I know we are driven most time by the impact factor. It hasn't got one yet. It's new, but if you look at the structure for submission of papers, you find out that you submit and justify every, um, every adjoining data that you submit. And you must make sure that the methodology will be so simplistic in nature that reproducibility would be very, very simple. Yeah, so we need to help ourselves. Another thing I found that also as a huge in our growth in science and research is the difference we'll find in this continent. You look at this bus, the laboratory owner is coming into the lab. You see the supervisors are standing at attention like a governor is coming in or a president is coming in just to welcome him. And you can see the junior researcher, the students, they bowing on the floor just to welcome him. This is what we're doing. A lot of us in this audience are mentors and some of us are mentees and some play dual roles. So what are you doing in your laboratory? Are you employing difference that your students can no longer assess you, you become um, a credible, incredible hawk, or you become any kind of superman that is inaccessible and they can't talk to you. They dissuade creativity completely. And also debate necessary in the lab does not arrive because they can't debate with you. You did not make yourself accessible. This is not good. So we should take away different Stop thinking about being the boss because the boss will say go, but the leader will say let's go. So help those underneath to grow. Water them like the guy on the on the page, watering the mentee so he can grow, she can grow, and take over the space or even join hands. We form a big circle and we can approach the problem. So I'm saying that these these kind of things do not support desired level of quality in the development that we desire in Africa producing products and delivery of those products and services that we desire. So we can make modifications to what we have this day, maybe by uptake of indigenous knowledge to improve the condition that we find ourselves in. A lot of indigenous um, knowledge we have, like the one in Madagascar, they're using the organic, organic um, supplements for treatment of um, COVID-19 is making waves in the global space. There are a lot of indigenous knowledge, knowledge sorry, that we're using. We have the tea infusion from different herbal products that a lot of people are using. Different things that we do, even the way we look at things, influenced by culture, let's try to bring them in. But effective communication begets trust. So we really need to talk, our, talk to ourselves. We shouldn't hold information all of the time. We hold information so we can become the best, we can remain best. But you can't remain the best when you hold the information. But when you share it, you get a different perspective from colleagues with diversity in mind. You get better and you grow together. It's good to have many kings than to have one king and a lot of uh, servants. So a review of unnecessary attachments to origin. I found that, I found that in Africa that our curriculum vitae has um, origin, where you come from. Why, why does that matter in my research? Why does that matter in the place of work? I don't know. Yeah, some organizations, when you fill in form application, they will tell you to do that at the very last page, that this does not in any way come into judgment criteria, but just for, okay, for the uh, panelists or for data collection or something. But in Africa, we're not doing that. They need to know where you come from, the local government, the local authority, um, maybe your family name for tracing whether you, you really a strong family or nobody. Another one that gets me is the date of birth. What has the date of birth got to do with my delivery in my laboratory space? It has nothing to do with my age. So do we consider taking out the age from the curriculum by Ted like they do in Develop crimes. We need to think about all of this so people can be free. Because when the age is tight, when it's 30, 30 years, 50 years, 60 years, and you're above it, you're not free to open up. And people begin to lie. And when you lie, trust is going. And you can't trust because you have a lot of secrets covered that need to explode something. 
implementation of policies are very, very low. So we need to work on it by modification. So if we have a successful policy restructured in our institution to meet the specific needs of the institution and the environment, this will increase the technological um, oriented economy of Africa as a continent. And then we try to strengthen the public laboratories role because most of the public laboratories are not funded, they are not cared about, you don't have manpower, you don't have the skills, you don't have the equipment. So we can think about this. Remember that diversity just says that we are same inside, but we are different in our physical and other attributes. So it's not a characteristic of life, it's just a condition necessary for life. So we must do with diversity. Tim Benias also said that we need diversity of thought in the world to face new challenges. How can you have diversity of thoughts when you are all the same? And looking at intellectual property that we need to do in Africa, this image says that in order to have intellectual property, don't you think you need to be intellectual? So a lot of us are not thinking about it. So let's get the stuff so we can think about the IP. You have to first be an intellectual before you can have an IP. So let's get serious with our works in the laboratory. I know it's not easy. Let's continue to do our advocacy and improve our science communication skills so they can know what value we add to the society and come in as government and come in as industry to help. So I have just simple definition of IP here. And some of us already have got IP in, in form of patents, copyright, trademarks for all of the work, good works we are doing. So intellectual property rights system is unable to protect indigenous knowledge in our continent. This is not good. The traditional medicine, the herbalists, and different people who do different things with indigenous knowledge. We are not working with them. We are not giving them the want. We are only giving them the competency. Remember competency and want. That's why they're not opening up to get us to have an IP around our indigenous knowledge. Because if they have IP, with their indigenous knowledge, they will be able to feel free and share with us so we can move forward. We are really rich. So, in conclusion, I say bias that has trickled into our laboratories colors our decision that we make on a daily basis without our knowing it. And these cues are deliverables. And I say here again, the same moves, same faces, old ideas, same designs, same perception, kill innovation. So why don't we try diversity? For it will strangle the identity crisis that a lot of us are having as researchers and give birth to wisdom and strength. So let's grow Africa. I recommend that we build our capacities to become conscious, make the unconscious conscious. Those unseen killers that deprive us of harnessing the diversity in our laboratories to grow the continent. Let's build our capacity making them conscious. And I said we should work together to help correct erroneous beliefs that are in our minds about different races, different colors, different countries, what their limitations are. Let's work together, we we'll correct some of these erroneous beliefs, knowing that we are the same. Content is only the attributes we're seeing that are different. So if you look at the color I presented you with on the first page, the color, beautiful color of diversity. So I invite you to make your choice. Whiskey, rum, gin, vodka, tequila, all of them are found in these beautiful places. So come on board and thank you so much. You've been a very beautiful audience. Thank you so much, Yukaria. Thank you for, for, for a very interesting talk. Um, so I'm just going to open up for, for questions. And I think we already have a few of them, um, which we're going to start with. And then, um, and then if anyone wants to ask a question, they'll raise their hand and then I'll give them um, the floor to talk. So just to start, um, there's someone, um, so I, I think it's Professor Lucky asked, how does diversity affect quality and acceptability of a laboratory results. 
okay, how does diversity affect acceptability and quality of laboratory results? Great. So diversity, the differences we have in the laboratory bring different perspectives and experiences to bear in the laboratory. So that also, because when we're designing research questions, we challenge them to know the options that are available and the best. So already it has an added advantage, an added flavor to what comes out of that laboratory. And even when you're looking for funding, the funders think that it's a better deal to fund research groups that have diversity in them than the monotonous uh, research groups. So this helps the quality because there are many perspectives to that research than you have when everybody thinks the same way. Hmm. And, and Stephen is, is, um, is asking in regards to the, to the current events that are ongoing, um, especially with uh, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. So how do you think Africa can take advantage of the current times to secure mutual and equal ownership in our collaboration, research and development? Yeah, for us to secure mutual equality or equity, in mm -hmm. our collaboration, we need to build our capacity. That's what I'm saying. A lot of times we don't have our capacities built as Africans. So we always think like we are cats. I said that before, we always meowing, meow, meow, help me. So whatever we get from the other parties in the collaboration, if they're outside Africa, we think that they're helping us. So if you build a capacity and you have enough to contribute and you get out of the difference, that comes with you working with your senior or with the principal investigator, that you respect people without really getting to the extreme of difference. So you know you have equal opportunity and the work that you do in the collaboration, you discuss and share roles. So some persons have 60%, 40%, 20%, depending on the kind of uh, research, the kind of collaboration and the agreement. You must reach agreement so you don't rock on the way. So if we build a capacity to know this is what is due me and you go for what is due you and you behave not like the cats begging always for um, a ball of a ball of fufu. So we will mm. be better for it, yeah. So we continue to build our capacity like we're doing now, speak to us, know our rights, know what is embedded in us that we can do with the can-do spirit in Africa. Use our communal life that we have in Africa bring everybody on board so we can see the diversity in play. Yeah, at play, people come with best practices in the lab about cleaning the laboratory, about managing waste, different things when you come to same laboratory with diverse background, you see that that laboratory begins to work better. So we can use that to improve the collaboration conditions that we get into. Yeah, uh, Blessing, um, I've given you the floor. Please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, um, thank you very much. And I must say, uh, well done, uh, Eukarya. That was a, a beautiful, inspiring um, presentation you, you did there. And um, my question, just before I, I, I jump into my question, I just want to um, contribute um, in the area of building capacity. Because when you talk about a functional and a successful laboratory, um, as it were, you know, for us to replicate that in Africa, you talk about capacity and the capacity goes not, you know, it, the, the diversity is also part of, is, is, is the, um, you know, the expertise that you have in that, in that lab. So whereas we might probably be looking at maybe people from different tribes or race or you know, whatever region they come from to be part of our lab. But, you know, the expertise they, they bring to the table is what makes that lab. So I want to challenge every one of us that is on this floor listening to this um, 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 you know, seminar this afternoon for us to go back and think how we can make our lab more inclusive, how we can think of designing, you know, multidisciplinary research you know, and that is what makes, you know, capa um, the abuse capacity in the lab. You know, we Africans, we have, we've been trained to, 
you know, look at things only from one perspective, just like Eukarya pointed out. So when you want to design a research, maybe for me, uh, uh, a microbiologist, I shouldn't just be thinking about a microbiology research. I should be thinking about how a physicist, how a surgeon, and how a social scientist can come into my research and be part of that. That way we make room for more questions to be asked, for more challenges to be thrown up, and we get a more inclusive data, you know, that can be implementable out there. That's just my contribution. But anyway, my question that has been bothering me is, um, and everyone is free to answer or give a perspective, not just to Eukarya, because it's really an, an African um, problem. How can we break this bridge, you know, between the private, public, and the um, institutional um, 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 laboratories, or, or maybe the university-based research laboratories. Because what we see is, you know, um, the private establishments that have their labs and they do their thing, and you have, you know, the public um, national laboratories, they have their lab and they do their thing, and you have parallel researches going on on the universities. There is little of a crosstalk or a collaboration, you know, that helps to build this capacity that we're talking about. Um, being that the problem we are trying to solve is the same problem. Everybody is just trying to solve the same social problem, the same developmental problems. And we need to come together to look at how, how you know, we can break that wall. So that is the question I'm putting out there, you know, for us to think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Blessing, for um, further reiterating the point I had made that diversity goes to different attributes, and I mentioned interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approach to science as being part of diversity. Yeah, so, and I, I did say again that the moment solution to a problem has a societal relevance, it's no longer acceptable to restrict the tools to a single field. That's why other fields will come in because it has a societal relevance. So looking at how we can work with the private laboratories and public laboratories, how we can bring them together, we in public institutions and those are private. Um, I talked about um, science communication. Today's talk is not on science communication. I just mentioned it in passing. It's really very important that we grow our capacity for science communication because we are not communicating what we're doing. I'm doing it here, you're doing it there. I do not know you're doing, you do not know I am doing it. So we reinvent the wheel. Either I, I finish before you, you may get to the publishing space before me, or you may get to find the government before me. So we need to be talking and we encouraging all of our scientists to belong to professional societies in your field and in some of the liberal societies like um, the research management society like Warima, the West African one we have here in West Africa and different kinds of society. So when we go there, listen to colleagues and present our research, we know what others are doing and they know what we're doing. So we can find a meeting point and then we find the strength in our diversity, either in our different fields or in our different experiences and peculiarities. We become better and bigger. But if we keep what we're doing, everybody does it to hide it, to only bring it when it's promotion time. It doesn't help us. We have this disconnect always. So I think this is my suggestion that we try to amplify what we're doing, the impact of our work on the society, the impact of our work on the development of the continent, of the region, of the country, of our immediate environment need to be amplified. If we do this, people who are like-minded, people who are doing what we're doing, can write us email, can give us a phone call, can find us on social media, and we can do things together. We can see how we collaborate and make it holistic. And those private laboratories, oftentimes, they, uh, maybe they have loans from banks to run those uh, experiments, to buy the equipment and all of that. So they also may not be very, very willing to come out to collaborate with you in the public space. So that's why I also talked about trust. So we need to build trust with the people who need to work with us, the people we want to collaborate with. 
and also get government to make enabling policies that will make this happen, not just policies that are not implemented. We need all of them on the page. We need all the industry, the government, and the researchers on the same table on a triple helix format. And then we can get all of this working. Government needs to help us. We are doing us, we, we need to keep pushing information out in the way they can understand it to meet our target audience. But government needs to do this and the industries also need to do investment in this direction. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think Fanny, uh, Fanny, you have the floor, you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, while we wait for Fanny to I, unmute. I, I, I only want to congratulate the presenter because they have really exposed so many facts concerning diversity. It doesn't have any limitation. It can be seen in any vast majority of what we are doing in the world. And people have to learn. It's just a contribution. But uh, we are one. And therefore, we have to work with each other. But when God created man, he created them with everything around him. And we need to team up so that we can make success and build the future of our world, especially in Africa. Nation. Thank you. And congratulations. Thank you, Thank you Fanny. Um, so there's another question around um, how can standardization or unified grading interpretation and representation of quality be encouraged so that diversity can speak with one voice? How can standardization and what? Standardization be encouraged so that diversity can speak with one voice. So standardization here, they meant unified grading, interpretation and representation of quality. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're doing our research most times in Africa in isolation. We're not getting the regulators on board with us. So we need to get out of the laboratory. Oftentimes we lock ourselves in the laboratory. That's why we lack warmth and we are unable to influence people. So when you're done with the laboratory space, depending on what space you're using for your laboratory, as I showed on the earlier slide, you get out, get some fresh air by looking around. Before you started a research, you had objective, yeah? You had a goal, you had a mission. Where are you heading to? Who is supposed to consume your research? Is it only to add to the existing data or you have some other objectives? So identify your audience, the people who need to hear and find them. Do a little bit of audience baggage to know where you can find them and how you can find them. Some of them you can find simply on the social media. Some you can write to letters to get audience with the Minister of Education, with the Director of whatever planning. You know, you find the people who are supposed to be your audience to do the influence that you want to exert with your research. So let's begin to meet them. Even if we can meet as individual researchers, we can meet the directors of research. That's why Africa is working hard to see that all research institutions, higher learning places, that they should have research management as an entity. So you have a director managing research. So maybe that entity, that person, the director or whatever nomenclature he has, where it is existing, can take up that job. We can have a boss, we can have the opinion boss, and we make suggestions to this person who in turn carries it out. But also the age is fast eroding where we leave all the jobs to the bus. We also need to market ourselves and our science. So you can also market while you, while you make an effort to get the bus to market it. You also may need to do it yourself. And also we need to cooperate. There is something um, Professor Lucky on the page here talks about what we do when the regulators come to see us during accreditation. What roles do we play as researchers when they come? Do we really open ourselves up to the scene so they can improve the place? Or do we just become accomplices to see that we only get accredited 
without really meeting the standard the expectations of that exercise of accreditation. So all of the regulators, you know, we need to help them to help us. We should stop doing the data policies that we find in some places in Africa. We offer money to regulators to give us the pass mark. We need to get out of that. Our researchers, we are responsible people. We do rigorous exercise to be able to come up with scientific information. So we must, as a matter of urgency, be responsible enough to teach the regulators what we want them to do. We bring them on, on board when they come to visit us for accreditation exercises. And we can write policy papers and send out when we do studies on what poor standardization or weak implementation of the standardization has cost, or even the structure, the framework, if it's, dilapid if it's um, um, dilapidated or um, weakly constituted, we can project this in our policy papers to policymakers so they can put this on the table for discussion. And we also monitor to see that it gets to the next level. So this is what we can do. We can leave it to anybody or we cry always, say within ourselves, our researchers, and do nothing afterwards. We're not going to have any result from that. Mm. Thank you. And, and there's uh, Professor Frank who wanted um, to ask, how can we incorporate um, the traditional medical pr practitioners in, in, especially if we're talking about diversity? So he was saying that he, what his experience is that most of them do not open up to 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 scientists as um, it, yeah do not open up to scientists. Yeah, thank you. I, I had um, mentioned it before because we refuse to create trust and we are not one. When we visit the traditional uh, medicine practitioners, what do we do? We raise our shoulders like the scientists have arrived. I am Doctor Yukaria Oluchimwaichi. I am professor. You know, so we come on the side of authority and then difference will come in also the difference we're talking about so they do not want to open up because they're looking at you as a god there are two ways they can look at you either they say this person cares about what i do so i am god or this person cares about me so he is god so which side are you playing are you making them see you as god or making them see themselves as god so we should try to build trust by having active communication. Why are we here? Most times we like to get information like a secret. We like to get information without them realizing it. We need to be clear, we need to be open. What we want, how, if you give me this information, I want to help you by getting the information and working on it and find out why you use this. For example, this herb, you use it as a lasective. Yeah, so I want to do an experiment and provide answers why they work as laxative. Maybe this one will go overboard and you have purging maybe for a day, this one for three days. What are the chemical compounds? What are the interplays in biology of individuals that make for those differences? I provide the answers to you so you can properly manage your patients. If possible, we go to dosage because some persons have a problem of the dosage, use a cup of water, use a cup of vodka, vodka to mix this herb. And a cup could be 35 CL for some persons, it could be 20 CL, it could be 50 CL. Explain to them, I'll help you to have a standardized amount so that each of your patients will use exactly the same thing and the results are likely to be similar, except there are influences from other associated health conditions that individuals suffer or, you know, the general health of the individual. So we explain to them, if they really understand that we want to help them, they come out. But if the communication is weak, like when I have to, when I had to interface with them, my students went before, they didn't open up. I had to travel with my students to meet them and they opened up. So the manner of communication is important. We have to be patient. Remember the, it is three and it is four. So where you're seeing it from in your competency is very correct. 
And where they're seeing it from their own competency is very correct, but because you don't recognize their informal education and you misunderstand them. And when they see that you have a hidden agenda, they're not gonna divulge information to you. So let's learn communication, active communication. Let's try to gain trust and let's show some warmth to those that we interact with, those we work with, so that we can make progress, yeah? Yeah. Um, Chioma was asking also, um, how can we use the adversity to enhance uh, research credibility? Because he's saying in some spaces, having collaborators in your research from other African universities is not recognized and welcomed. And then also, how do you break the, the cycle of, of uh, pure African research um, publishing in good impact journals? Okay, so collaboration ordinarily brings sufficiency and highlights hidden solutions, as said that earlier, because of the diversity of knowledge, diversity of other attributes of diversity. So collaboration among Africans is still because of identity crisis, I said, we need to overcome. A lot of researchers in Africa, even when they are doing very well in the space, in quote, they are not sure of who they are because they look up to the other client as the real people. I am just trying to exist. So if you solve the identity crisis where the researchers in the African laboratories, in the teams, in the group, research groups, have proper identity of, of who they are, what their competencies are, I have a, a paper published on, on a research gate. Some researcher from Spain asked me a question. I answered, he brought another one. I answered, he, you know, until he gave up and said thanks. So if I didn't have an identity and he asked the first question, I ran away. <laughs> so I sold out. And then whatever I do in the future, some other persons have read our correspondences on the research gate. So if they know my name and I ran away, I took a flight because of my own signs. I lost it all. So when they find something coming from either Port Harcourt, where I stay, or River State, or University of Port Harcourt, wherever my affiliation is, they tend to put a question mark on all of those. So this is how we lose it as Africans. We need to really restructure identity and be sure what we're doing. Let's run away from being master of everything chasing trend. This is where the money is. Everything now is environmental. Everybody go into the environmental. Everything is climate change. We are heading there. I am there already. So let's build an identity. What are you competent? What are you known for? And then sell your science using different channels. Sell your science and sell who you are. So that builds reputation. It's not easy because of our peculiarity in Africa, but we build it with time and we believe ourselves, we go. And most times we are not preaching to focus on impact factor journals because there are a lot of impact factor journals that are not better than those without impact factor. Just because they have existed longer, remember the number of years they calculate that, the usability within that number of years. If a journal is very new, maybe one year old, it's not gonna have any impact factor, but it may be great in the constitution of the editorial board and in their review processes. So it could be a good journal. So we mustn't bury our head. It must be an impact factor journal. Yes, it can be, it can be a good one. And if we only patronize the impact factor journals, we can grow new journals and have a local relevance. So what we're saying that the journals that were floating in Africa and anywhere, we should look at them that they are not in any way predatory journals. They are journals that are formed on the, uh, on the uh, tri tripod of what a journal should be in, in terms of the editorial board constitution, um, the running of the journal, how they do the peer review system. So we should understand that and know what a good journal. And then the internationalization, how many people are able to send papers to the journal? How are they making their reach? Because if you consider the editorial board in a good way, they all market the journal and bring in people who are good in the area. And then making sure that the journal is not overly generic. Journal in climate change is publishing 
uh, health, he's publishing um, arts, design, he's publishing everything. So when it's overly generic, you put a question mark on it. And when you send them paper today, they send it back tomorrow, it's accepted, pay your APC. So all of those are bad um, indicators that this could be a bad journal. So you can publish in good journals that will get you um, hedge index. People will get to use your work because you publish at the right outlet where people who need to know about what you've done, who need to have the information are. If you just publish in a big journal with impact factor and nobody there longs for that work, it stays there for the rest of your life. Nobody cites it even once. So you have not achieved anything by publishing an impact factor journal and nobody used your work. So we should consider all of those. Um, I think the club has, has a question. Well, it, it's actually a comment because Blessing was interested in uh, finding out if there are ways that we can encourage the cooperation between the industry research institutions and academic institutions. So I wanted to just um, share a little bit on what we are doing at the academic institution that I'm working at. We align our research project to targeted industries or research institutions so that when we develop a proposal, we are working together. And then we identify the perhaps they could have a problem with a certain method. And when they have a problem with a certain method, the students can do research in terms of method development. So I think in a way it also allows for shared facilities. For example, if the instrument is down at the University of Botswana, I know that I'm working with National Food Lab, they're analyzing mycotoxins, we work together, and then I can send my students there. So I wanted to say that really in, in terms of an academic institution, it's key that we don't just come up with thoughts and um, on our own, there's an issue of involving the industry and research institutions. Thank you. Mm. Right. Thank you, Dikabo. Um, someone who doesn't have a name is called. Um, I don't know if she. You can talk. It's a, on a not seven. Raise your hand for a long time. But um, okay. Yes. You're unmuted now. You can go ahead and, and speak. If not, um, you carry, you can start with, uh, so Blessing again ask, um, in terms of policies, how can labs um, really in include uh, evidence of policy approach when designing uh, research questions? Okay, thank you Blessing for the question. So the laboratories to apply policy approach in design of your research is to properly do um, research, um, what I call it. So you, you have a problem, the policy problem, which may be different from the research problem because you want to influence a policy, you're asking for policy approach. So you want to influence a policy. So you need to understand what policy question you have to ask. So what is your policy question? So when you analyze the policy question, you frame it, then you can begin to do your synthesis, okay? So the first thing you do is to find the policy question. So am I trying to influence policy around, um, let's say, waste management? what kind of waste, because it doesn't have to be very big, like a regular research for a publication and article. You're thinking about a policy. So it has to be, it has to be very specific, not bogus. Okay, that policy, waste around plastic materials. And what about the waste? You keep making it specific. Ask the question until it becomes specific. Then find out, who are my audiences? Is he a minister? Is he the House of Assembly members? Is he a Senate member? Is he the director of um, environment? 
a unit of your university or of the state, local authority, what, who? Or are they the secondary audience, those who can influence the primary audience, the people who have the power to influence the policy that you have in mind? So when you do all of that, so you'll be able to carve your policy question correctly and then do the necessary search, the believable domain you will use to frame, okay, the policy options. So if you find out the believable, because by and large, when you meet these people, when eventually you are ready, you send out uh, your policy brief or policy letter, and you are invited, you need to be very believable because the policymakers don't have all of your time. They're very busy. So they don't have the time to give you two opportunities or three opportunities. So that's why you need to do a groundwork to find out everything about the policy you're influencing. Is there a new policy you want formulated? Or is it an existing policy you want expanded? Or is it, is it a policy, good policy that is not implemented? So you are writing to get the policy to be um, implemented. So you're trying to see them cross through the policy window and then get attention by the policymakers. So audience is very important. And then the question, what is in for them? Try to make your problem framed around the mandate of your audience. What is the mandate? You can align it with any burning, any burning agenda, like the SDG, like the AU agenda, you can find where your, your problem, the policy problem and question can fit in in any of this. So make it come with the burning agenda for your audience, the government, the Senate, the parliament, whoever it is. So when you do it, they're interested because you're helping them to also do their job. So when you frame it properly and you get them interested, then the next question is what should they do what do they do? So you have three messages in your policy statement. You have the message that says your finding from your research. The second message, second level message, the implication of your finding. What does that finding mean to the society? Then mm -hmm. what should they do? That's the recommendation. So given the finding and the implication, this is what you need to do. And who would do it? You have to point who, not just generic. Government should, nobody's government, who? The Minister of Environment should. The members of the parliament should. The, yeah, so the state government, the director general of this government agency. So you make it specific so they understand. And when they're making a yes or no, or forming a committee, to have a closer review of your submission or invite you again, it can immediately begin. You can see action. So this is what you can do to uh, get your lab invite evidence of policy approach. So trying to understand how to frame a policy question. You may need some training if you haven't been training in uh, evidence and policy. So you may have to subscribe for that training if you haven't been trained, then if you understand that and framing your policy question very well, identifying your audience and the message for the audience. Again, I forgot the format of the message. You have the message, the right message, but the wrong format, so it's not gonna go. But if you have the right message, the right channel and the format, then it will go. So you carry, I'm going to talk about, to tell you like one last question and then after you answer it, Blessing will make the last comment, last question, because I think we're almost out of time. Um, and then that should be, that should be it. So the question from Felaga is, um, how can we improve our local laboratory, laboratories by collaborations with industries and organizations? So he says the quality of research is a function of quality equipment and working environment Hence, before we talk diversity, young scientists need proper training locally. And we as researchers and scientists help improve infrastructure of our labs. 
here how you can improve the infrastructure in the lab as a scientist would be to gain uh, the, the skill of writing proposals. So if you're a researcher and you don't have the skill of writing proposals, then you have not started as a researcher. So if you learn the skill of writing proposal, now your, your affiliation to scientific organizations will help you to have access to different calls that are made each day, both on the continent and outside the continent, even by the industries and some um, non-governmental organizations. So when you have access to such information, you can respond. And I keep saying that scientists, researchers, that we need to build our profile online because the world has become a global space that each time the funders are forming their boards and they're looking for you, they go online to find you. Most times now they ask you to put your handle, your Twitter handle, you put your Facebook handle and all of those. So this is not the time researchers who are overly influenced by culture or religion, who don't want to go out there because of some reservations. This is not the time. If you want to be a scientist, you really need to come out to be a scientist. You need to be proud of being a scientist. You need to come out there and say, here I am a scientist and this is what I do and I'm proud of it. Yeah, so if you do that, it helps to make you win the grant you're applying because they can find you that you are really not a robot, you're a real person. Because a lot of people collect this thing and disappear. They don't write reports, they don't submit nothing. And then the email becomes moribund. They write a lot of emails, nobody responds, and that's it. So somehow they do a lot of check these days to see that you're a real person after writing a good proposal. So let's go out there to say I am here. And the kind of things you say on the social media, you can really have more than one social media account if you can manage the two. You can use one social media account mm -hmm. for both social and professional if you can manage it. But if you can manage it, please create one for professional purpose and one for pure social. They want to see the kind of discussion. When people post important scientific information, what do you say? Like, like, only like. So you show that you're a lazy person. Yeah, sometimes you're so busy, you like, but you can't be liking everything, you just like. Once they post, you say like, you so like, and what your networks are saying and what they are doing also affects you. So you, know, you need to know who will be your friend, who will be your connection. All of these are important for you to win a grant to improve your laboratory. And then trying your best to get a good mentor, to get a champion. So a mentor is different from a champion. So the champion may not have a long lasting relationship with you, may not have quality time with you like your mentor. The champion may just be that person that prompts you to say, go, go. Have you had go? Have you submitted you are supposed to? And all of that, it prompts you and it's just there to show you the path. And if you need the reference letter, immediately he does it. He can give you access to his email to go get something there and come back for, you know, some kind of person who go out of their ways to just get you going on your career path. So those are your champions. You need to know them because they will point you to information. Knowledge is really power and knowledge is not located in any nation. So you really need to open up as a scientist. It's not the time to pass uh, cast as passion or judgment on your supervisor. He is not good, she is not good. You can get messed with people who already messed. So you can find mentors who will help you through your supervision. You may have a supervisor, okay, but you may have a mentor or mentors who will help you go through your work without really getting all of them from your mentors. There is no reason scientists don't accept no for an answer. So you can't say because my supervisor is not good, I'm not gonna be good, no. Reject such and move forward. You must find solutions. There are a lot of people who are waiting with an open hands to grab you. It's just for you to reach out and then they grab your hand. So advertise yourself, go to conferences and talk to people who make good presentations, tell them I, I like to be on, in your network. Okay, so if we do this, I think we will grow and help our lab to grow. And building our labs is very important to see that we need government also. We need institutional support because sometimes when we win a grant, we don't even have a physical space to put them. 
depending on the kind of laboratory and the kind of activities that will happen there. So we also need institutional support. So using different societies in the institution, you should be able to interact with the, uh, the administration, the powers that be, to make um, support, give a good institutional backing and support to laboratories, and have the HSC persons who will help to improve the safety of the place and the health. Because if people who do experiment continually fall sick and maybe die from there or are deformed, you have less people who patronize the lab. If you have all of the equipment and nobody's coming there for experiment, it goes obsolete and then it's a waste. And you won't have that enough justification for your funder. If you've got equipment and in two, three years, four years, you haven't got good publications or even IP from it, and you've not shown evidence with connection to society or your environment, is a waste. So whatever you have, um, we are caretakers. Make sure you caretake, uh, caretake the equipment, caretake the environment, the community where you work or where you research. Make sure you are warm. Um, blessing, you, you do the last question um, and then we close. Thank you very much for the opportunity and um, thanks everyone again for, for listening. It's been a very useful conversation. Um, mine, um, um, the question about uh, um, evidence for policy approach um, that I put forward. Um, thanks, Ukaria, for, for doing a great job um, um, on that question. You know, um, but my take was more of challenging you know, our researchers in the African space to begin to adopt you know, evidence um, for policy approach or to think about it when they are trying to design their research or their proposal. So why do I say that? I, I'm saying that because every laboratory space is an agent of change. You need to consider yourself as an ag um, agent of change. And when you think yourself as an agent of change, you, we have the capacity to be able to influence policy. And that comes you know, from the, the data and the statistics that we are churning out from our laboratory or the research work that we are doing. You know, so, um, um, and that is what is going to bring about the change that we're looking about. The, we, on the African space, we really need to come to that point where we have to use inductive data to support the changes that we are, you know, that we want to see. And researchers are in a very key position to do that. You know, we, we, we can churn out the numbers, we can do the research, we can come out with those statistics, you know, but because, you know, the awareness is not so much about that, you know, we tend to do things and, you know, just design things just for promotion sake, or maybe just to get a recognition sake, but that is not the issue. Can we come, can we have a shift where if you're beginning to think of designing a research proposal, can you think of, you know, a brief that you can develop out of it that can be pushed into the policy space. And that goes away to talk about how much we develop our communication channels. Um, you can have said so much about that. I'm not going to uh, belabor um, that particular point, but it's, it's something I, I feel we should start having that awareness. If we're talking about strengthening the diversity in our laboratories, and to harness, you know, the, the, the skills and the talent and the wealth of knowledge we have in Africa, then we begin to, we have to begin to do things differently. We have to begin to think of how to use, you know, uh, the research output from our laboratories to begin to influence the change. And I think that's what this meeting is about um, um, this evening. And again, um, can we begin to push, uh, you know, to have um, a centralized, you know, laboratory systems. The reason why I say that again is because we know that um, many of the African countries, you know, are under resourced. So, but we can galvanize, you know, our knowledge and our skills across board if we have, you know, if we begin to push more for, you know, centers of um, research excellence as against building independent research you know uh, facilities that again is collaboration and that again um is is diversity so these are my thoughts you know um that i'm living with all of us this evening and thank you very much for the opportunity again thank you Bryson. um you carried you have a final a final comment around um around all of this uh, yeah um my final comment will be we should 
do all we can to embrace diversity in knowledge, diversity in physical attributes, diversity in, in, in fields of science in all that we do is really very important. And we should try to test our skills of science communication by employing diversity. If I'm working with people in different fields or people from different countries or different culture, religion, and they're able to understand me, I am in one way testing, testing my skills. Whether I am using jargons, whether I am one, whether I'm acceptable, you try this because you don't sit down and make it a model and think it works except by doing. So begin to experience it. How many conferences have you gone that, that are interdisciplinary in nature or intercontinental or intracontinental? How many of the contacts you collected ID cards, um, you collected complementary cards? What did you do with them after all? You put them in your bag or you put them in the trash can? Did you ever say it was nice meeting you somewhere and ask one question, can we do this together? I actually love this your publication, what can we do? So let's ask this question. Let's open our hands and our hearts. Let's not think about our home friends and home colleagues that we can collaborate with, that we can do things with and not research for money all the time. If we can, let's help people that we, we are better off than yeah, it helps in the long run. It's not all about money. In science, we build reputation. Reputation is bigger than money in science. So let's be real scientists in practice and in our thoughts. Thank you, Kara. Thank you very much for everyone for, for attending. This is really a, a very important conversation around diversity, especially even in the African context, how every scientist, everyone can contribute to ensure that the research questions that we, uh, we asked ourselves um, answer to, to how diverse all of us are, how our research can influence policy and all the other best practices that we should be implementing to, to see Africa actually lead in the fourth industrial revolution. So thank you everyone. We have these, um, we, we, we will share the recording.